live from the studios in Vermont and Kentucky. It's Riding Nerdy News with the Riding Nerdy News crew. Good evening, Sir Jay. How's it going? That's going well. Long time no see, dude. Right, yeah, this one's been uh, in the pipeline for a minute. Yeah, it has been. <laughs> it's it's funny how life happens on a Thursday. Uh, of course, you, you had you had some festivities two weeks ago, and I had uh, <clears throat> a little a little kerfuffle with the old plumbing, uh, which is not a euphemism. I mean, literally, <laughs> I uh, uh, had had to uh, had to quickly move some things around. So, anyhow, uh, I am very happy that we are back after an unintentional two week hiatus. Uh, so welcome, welcome, welcome to Right and Nerdy News with the Right and Nerdy News crew. I'm Chris, and our lead anchor. And I'm Jay. And uh, Mr. Lead Anchor. Good to be back. I, about to say, I believe we have a, a burning question right off. Um, uh, we do. And uh, I, I will let you introduce it. As So per tonight's topic, uh, this was inspired by, uh, of course, I'm, I'm still doing my 100 movie challenge. Uh, 100 movies in a year it has i came out of the gate strong i gotta say it's slowed down a lot um (laughs) certain things it's it's hard to explain you come out with so much energy and you're like i'm gonna knock this out easy i'm gonna watch 100 movies that that's a piece of cake uh and at a certain point you hit a wall and you can only watch so many movies uh in a given month so uh uh last month and this month have been very slow for me but Something I have been doing is rewatching Christopher Nolan's filmography. Um, Christopher Nolan is a director who is he's a, he's a tad on the pretentious side, <laughs> but he's one of those guys who has almost earned that pretentious. Uh, I would kind of put James Cameron in this category as well, where they they're really notoriously demanding, and in James Cameron's case, sometimes hard to work with. But they give you such a great end result, you kind of say, oh, okay, you know, this is going to be a uh, swish. You know what I mean? Like, right. this movie's right. guaranteed money. Right. And especially right. with Nolan, in the case of Nolan, that man just prints money for WB. He prefers yeah. to work with WB. Um, and famously enough, he had a sort of informal agreement with WB that was, uh, they, they got him to do bands. And his agreement with them was one for me, one for you. And so the way it worked out, they got him to do Batman Begins. He agrees and he gets to do the Prestige. That was sort of the movie he wanted to make. Oh, okay. Which Prestige, gotcha. Prestige actually holds a place in my heart as what I think might be his best movie. But it is not my favorite. Um, and then they got him to come back for Dark Knight. And so they agreed to let him make Inception. He agrees to come back for Dark Knight Rises. And he is allowed to make what is my favorite Nolan film, Interstellar. So it's kind of funny looking back, looking at that uh, order of events and, and thinking like, would WB really had to be convinced to allow him to make movies like Inception and Interstellar, which were, you know, smash hits. Um, yeah, but I mean, the concept so was so... Was, oh, yeah, sorry. I, I forgot. We haven't actually introduced it yet. So, yeah, with that preamble. <laughs> right. All this, all of my preamble to lead up to the burning question being, what is your favorite Christopher Nolan film? Uh, and and so, in full disclosure, I've not seen all of uh, Christopher Nolan's uh, uh, filmography, actually. I've not seen The Prestige. I've heard really good things about it. Uh, I haven't seen Tenant. I haven't, I haven't even seen Memento, uh, believe it or not. Uh, which is Memento, I was very late to the party on that. The only one I haven't seen is his uh, his very first movie, which I can't remember. Memento is kind of considered his first big movie. Right. I can't remember the name of his first like movie. Oh movie. yeah, I've forgotten. Because um, yeah, it was a, it was like a really experimental one. Right. Um, hmm. Which okay. I love Tenet a lot. Uh, Tenet, Tenet didn't really stick with me as much as his other movies, but it is definitely worth a watch. It's it's actually worth more than one watch because it is such a mind bender um and in true christopher nolan fashion he films as much of it as he can practically oh so nice tenant uses a lot of uh reverse time 
And so there are several scenes where there are actors who are having to act out scenes in reverse because the way he films it, he's going to flip it around for the movie so that everything is moving forward in reverse, if that makes sense. Uh, that's pretty cool, I got to say. <laughs> and it's got um, a starring role for, uh, uh, I want to say his name is John David Washington. Uh, it's Denzel Washington's son. Oh, yeah, yeah, right, yeah. It's uh, it's it's like one of his first big blockbuster starring roles. Nice. And uh, he's excellent in it. He's so good in that movie. Well, I, I'll definitely, I'll have to uh, give it a watch. I've heard, weirdly, I've heard mixed reviews on Tenet. Um, mm-hmm. uh, it, it, I think it, and it kind of has depended on who I've asked and how many uh, sci-fi mind-bendy films that the asked has seen. Uh, so uh, it, it is uh, that that's why I haven't seen it yet because it got surprisingly mixed reviews and it's one of those I didn't get a chance to see when it was uh, in theaters because it released relatively recently didn't it yeah it was uh, I think it was like I want to say it was a little it might have been a late 2019 but I almost want to say 2020 because it was I remember it being kind of like a a test of the theaters during COVID um, okay, that's kind of what I was thinking, it, which I couldn't remember if that was a if that was a real memory or not. Right. Uh, yeah, I'm looking it up. Uh, it is 2020. So yeah, I'll have to put that one on the old list. So of of the Nolan films out there, what I have seen, uh, which obviously then colors what my favorite film is because it's only what I've seen so far. I've seen the Dark Knight trilogy, uh, of course, and I've seen Interstellar. Uh, and I've seen Inception, uh, and let's see, I've seen Dunkirk, um, and I think that's about all of his that I've seen, so just kind of a handful. Uh, and, and and before I reveal my favorite, I will say I, I did actually get a chance to uh, poll quite a few of my friends and other people on this question, uh, so I actually have some voting oh, results. Nice. Uh, and, and, and I asked him exactly the same question. I said, hey, what's your favorite uh, Christopher Nolan film? And my response was either an immediate answer or who's that again? Uh, and what movies did he do? And so right. what, what I discovered is that if someone knew who Christopher Nolan was, they had an almost immediate favorite. And if they didn't, then their favorite was The Dark Knight. Uh, because when I went through the list of movies, that was the one they had most likely seen, at least in the in the circles of friends right. that I have, which includes apparently quite a few Batman fans. Um so hey, there's nothing wrong with that. No, not at all. I mean, that's the it's it's an it's a great little trilogy of films. I, I will say, absolutely. Uh, interestingly, I think my, f- but, but I think my favorite of the Dark Knight trilogy is actually Batman Begins. Um, nothing against Dark Knight. I think Dark Knight might, right, might even be the better movie in some regards. But uh, the it, it is the practicality of how he shot. Batman Begins, which is Gotham was shot in a Zeppelin hangar in Europe so they could get the really dark feel of the city. And I love that oh, fact wow, so much. Oh, yeah, that's the thing. So like the like the scenes when Christian Bale's like hanging upside down and stuff like that, those those effects are are there they are shot literally in the dark in a Zeppelin hangar with both ends closed with just the barest really of cool. lights. So they, they built totally Yeah. Yeah, and so that's the thing is like <laughs> that that whole piece it was a new take on Batman. Uh, at least as far as you know how it was done on the big screen uh, when I first saw it, so I was just I was enthralled with the concept. Uh, and so then when Dark Knight came out, it was an excellent film, and I watched it multiple times in the theaters. But it's you know Batman Begins just holds a special place in my in my uh, appreciation in terms of that trilogy. Uh, but yeah, so anyhow, the uh, right. results from who I polled, uh, Inception came out the clear winner with um, six and a quarter votes in favor of, followed. Uh, a little bit farther behind by Dark Knight with four votes, so it came in second. Uh, then uh, third place uh, eked out just barely ahead of Memento uh, with three and a quarter points for Prestige and three points for Memento for, for third and fourth place. Uh, and then I had a uh, one, one and a quarter votes for Interstellar, a vote for Batman Begins, and a quarter vote for Tenet. Uh, the quarter hey, quarter vote bad. was a that's particular friend ranking. of mine who would not let me pin him down in a, in a favorite, so he split his vote among his four favorite Christopher <laughs> Nolan films. <laughs> I think, if if I'm not mistaken, I want to say, I think Prestige 
if you're not counting the fact that Batman is a comic book character, I think Prestige is the only movie he's done that has a, like it's a source material. Uh, it was a novel before he made a, a movie adaptation of it. Oh, okay. Um, and then obviously Batman with his tons of comics. You know, right, the, right. The Batman trilogy. But other than that, I think they're all uh, original stories that he's written. But um, I'm definitely not mad at that list because uh, that there's really... Again, I hate to I hate to balloon his ego so much, but I know he's not listening to me. Because he, <laughs> yeah. he, he is he is such a pretentious guy. But damn it, if he can't make a great movie, yeah. I mean, and a lot of the issues with like the common criticisms you heard from like Inception or Interstellar, um, those two in particular, a lot of the the critiques you hear about those are just that they are they're easy to get lost in because they really do kind of demand your attention 100% yes. of the time. Yeah. And then you're also rewarded on rewatches and even the prestige a little bit, but um the prestige I would say the prestige is very easy to follow, but it definitely has a bigger payout when you watch it more than once. Yeah. Um and it and it still holds up. Uh and there's a reason he keeps going back to Christian Bale who is in that movie because uh Nolan and Bale just work so well together. Yes. Yes. Um and then Interstellar, in the case of Interstellar, it's it's my favorite Nolan movie, but I understand why people don't like it because a it does get a little bit silly. A lot a big aspect of that movie is the power of love, and uh, Anne Hathaway's character famously is quoted in that movie as saying like, "What if love was something we could quantify with science or whatever?" And that gets a little bit messy. And uh, of course, people don't like the um, spoilers if you haven't seen Interstellar. Uh, towards the end. Uh, Matthew McConaughey's memories are represented as a bookshelf from his old home, uh, as essentially a library of his memories, and that can that can come off as a little bit cheesy, <laughs> unless you're if you're a, if you're a dope like me, you fully bought into the movie and you don't care that he's floating in a bookshelf of memories. <laughs> well, I, that's actually what I was going to say. Is it, it turns out I think my favorite Christopher Nolan film so far, the ones I've seen, is also Interstellar. Um, it it has its flaws from like a because it it tries to be a hard sci fi film and does a good job of that up to a point and then it's it's still a fantasy film at a certain point, which that was one of the big critiques that I heard from a lot of people like ah it's not really hard sci fi it's like well I mean, mm. it, it, it's it's harder than a lot of quote unquote sci fi out there like they actually you know right. gave it a good go and and yes they have some stuff with black hole physics that is fantastical and like wormholes that are fantastical um well, in the way but I that's that's par for is... the course in a sci-fi so like i i appreciated how right. they did it he it, it almost feels like he tried to have his cake and eat it too because the first half of the movie is very much um from the behind the scenes stuff i watched they would get uh experts in any different field whether it be you know quantum physics or uh astronomy or whatever to to say like yes this is our best approximation of what this right, would look like right, right and so on and so forth and then there comes a certain point in the movie where the protagonists have to enter a black hole and at that point there is no expert you can bring onto the set you're kind of just playing with your own imagination right exactly um yeah because i mean the going theory is that the the gravity is just so intense that it, it shreds tears you apart but what if it didn't and, and right. that's and that's what the premise is. Of just like, yeah, what if we just like bear with me? What if we just put that aside? Right, and then that's why the whole last one third of the film is really just kind of uh, up to his imagination. Yeah, or you know, he's he's trying to get you to put aside notions of reality to just follow him along this right weird sort of uh, sci-fi fantasy path. Um, <clears throat> but you talk about like. Uh, uh, practical effects on his movies. I think Interstellar probably has some of the most uh, extra, maybe non-practical effects because it is so much of like uh, uh, fantasy elements and things like that, um, and uh, really playing with his imagination. Uh, like in uh, just the other day, I watched a video of how he built the sets for Inception yeah, and how it took a, a crew of like a hundred people several months to build rotating hallways 
and uh, that's the kind of thing you're dealing with when you're when uh, you're watching a Christopher Nolan movie. But I don't I don't really know a whole lot about how they filmed uh, Interstellar because it really does the movie is half and half uh, farm in like Iowa or right. something or Montana. Right. I don't remember where it's supposed to take place, and then the set of the spaceship or you know flying through space. Um, but it uh, that. That really scratches the surface of our topic today is just space, the the terrifying mystery of space. Yeah, and I mean, and and with that, we've also got like some late breaking news in regard of that, so we can we can go over that as we go along. Um, and uh, shoot, with that, I'll just go ahead and start with the big news of the day. Like literally today, let's do twelfth of May, twenty twenty two. It was just released that uh, uh, the first photographs of. Uh, not f- photograph makes it sound like we a visual light. Sorry, a telescope has captured imagery of the supermassive black hole at the center of the Milky Way galaxy for the first time ever. Um, and it's really exciting from a science perspective just because it's long been theorized that that's what's out there, and the physics supported that pretty well. But, you know, there's there's something fun about actually having the image available and being like yep nope this is this is the experimental proof that that shows that the the theory holds water uh and we now have something that we can measure you know the magnitudes of the signal returns off of and actually learn more about what is uh uh, at the center of the milky way galaxy some which is a little scary (laughs) yeah yeah i know right (laughs) to to try to measure that well yes so speaking of scary when you mentioned that there were photographs, you failed to inform me that there is also a "quote unquote" audio recording of said black hole. Oh, I did not know. Well, that makes uh, sense because I think I assume they're to, using a radio telescope. I'm going to share that into off topic. They, uh, yeah, they apparently had to uh, they had to they had to bump up the octaves so that our ears could perceive right. it. Yeah. Um. And uh, you know, any fan of this show. We'll have heard Zach talk about Warhammer. Um, I can only imagine that this is what the warp sounds like because it sounds <laughs> it sounds like a living hell. <laughs> well, yeah, and that's I mean, and that's one of the interesting things about going back to Interstellar for a minute. The gargantua black hole that is uh, shown in Interstellar is essentially, as far as a a black hole that forms from a single star. Uh, or you know a, a star and whatever it kind of sucks in around it during the events uh, is like the worst case scenario black hole um, not counting these galactic black holes which are much much more massive but are also black holes that are formed and collide and and grow in that way so it's it's not a single star that's producing it um, and so like the accretion disk which is the the disk of light around the black hole it wouldn't have been as bright as it was in the movie interstellar uh, they had to amplify that to make it essentially more visually stunning. It was one of the creative choices that Christopher Nolan made that I think works really well for Interstellar because otherwise um, the space is dark, so it adds some light to help tell the story, uh, quite literally. Uh, But you do get that wild-looking like right-angle ring because of the gravitational lensing effects, the way that the mass of the singularity is literally bending space around it. And so the straight line quote unquote that light takes is no longer a straight line from a geometric perspective it, it it still is from a physics perspective so light follows that path because a straight line is still the, the shortest path but the effects of gravity cause it to do that weird loop where it looks like the orbit of the stuff falling into the black hole are, are kind of almost looping over on itself um, but so like so taking that and then looking at the imagery they've released there is a massive accretion disk around the supermassive black hole at the center of the universe, and you can see bright spots in the disk. It's not nearly as impressive as, uh, the, the, you know, the, the imagery is not impressive like Gargantua is in the movie. But if you look at the two side by side, you could say, yeah, wait, now hold on, those bright spots look like that's where the accretion disk is crossing each other. Like, there is there is information we can glean, like, from what, what little fuzzy uh, details we can make out on the image. Uh, but so it, it turns out the supermassive black hole at the center of the Milky Way galaxy is four million times the mass of our sun. Gosh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. So think of our sun, which is already well, almost, big. And yeah. Those are figures that are honestly like I can't even wrap my head around. 
how insane that is. Well, no, and that's e- exactly because that was I was talking about this with a friend of mine, and um, we we were even having trouble because I honestly have not studied black hole physics in some time, and when I did, it was just a little bit because it was when I was doing some some physics studying, um, and we were trying to remember what the largest star compared to the sun was, and I'm actually looking pulling that back up right now. Uh, do, do, do. Uh, that's the radius. Where's the mass? Come on now. So I can keep these estimates the same. Ah, there we go. No, that's not it. Uh, oh, heck. Control F, massive. Yeah, here so we I go. I think a question, that, a question that pops into everybody's head is, what do we stand to learn from taking pictures of the black hole at the center of our universe? Well, so it, it's one of the, I guess, kind of common misconceptions in a way, because a lot of people understand that a black hole is a natural phenomenon that light can't escape from. So it's it's the remnants, right. um, the ones that form from stars are the remnants of supermassive, or sorry, not supermassive, of massive stars. I'm going to try not to use supermassive too much because supermassive for the galactic black hole is a whole totally different mass scale from hey, a massive I say, star. I say go for it. This is a this is a supermassive episode. I was about you to can, say. You can throw that word around all you want. Well, and that's one of the first fundamental problems with talking about any of this is that the objects we're talking about are huge and it look beyond human comprehension because even when we think of the sun, right. our perception of the sun on Earth is the, the bright disk in the sky. So you don't really have a sense of scale because it's so bright it hurts to look at. You, it, like it it just it seems like a disk, not a sphere necessarily, which is part of why it took us so long to figure out how the solar system actually worked because our observations of it, we were looking at 3D objects kind of, you know, traveling these great distances so they look 2D and and look like they travel the sky in linear paths, not in orbits and things like that. So when, you know, ancient um, sky watchers were coming up with some of the first theories, uh, some of them interestingly got it right like you know Greece figured out a long time ago that the earth was round so there's like you know the assumption well the earth is round so these other objects might be round but then like when you look at some of the like well they uh, figured it out and uh, some people have not caught on yet (laughs) yeah that's true that's true (laughs) yeah Um, and so then when you look at uh, like some of the like navigational charts and things they track the stars as like moving back and forth across the northern sky or the southern sky or things like that. And it's it's much later that we realize kind of how the solar mechanics and the uh, galactic mechanics and everything else work to orbit centers of mass. So the sun actually is, you know, I- I- as far as human comprehension, much, much more massive than the Earth. Even thinking about how big the Earth is is kind of a little bit beyond human comprehension because it's an object so big that we perceive it as being flat. You know, because it's like the curvature right. is so big compared to our size, it doesn't look like we're standing on a round ball, even though we are. And it's not something that we can we can't compare it to anything else right. because it's, right. we're literally on it. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and I want to make sure I put it in off topic. There's a great um, uh, website that that scales our solar system to if the moon was the size of a pixel, and then puts everything at <laughs> at a at a relative scale to that, both in size and distance. And it, it does help bring home just how empty space is. Because our solar system, when you look at it on like a textbook, just to fit all the planets on the page, we actually have to compress the distances between planets by so much, it makes our solar system feel a lot closer than it actually is. Uh, when it's actually really mostly empty space. And which is why it's so hard for you know NASA to launch a spaceship from the Earth to get a probe to Mars, because you're actually aiming at a tiny target in a mostly empty space that you have to very carefully right. plan out the course and the math and the you know the thrust vectoring and you know slingshot orbits around other things to get in you know, it's like this it's this whole there's a reason why rocket science is complicated and that's part of it. It's not just getting the thing off the ground. It's also that you don't really have a target. You can just, you know, with your with your thumb work out. Yeah, I should just fly that way. It's <laughs> it's it's a lot harder. All of that preamble exactly. out of the way. So our sun is already massive, kind of beyond easy human comprehension. But our sun will never become a black hole. So that's like that's one of the first inter- interesting things about studying black holes is only certain stars can form a black hole. It requires an amount of mass initially for the. Uh, supernova and resulting collapse to actually form a, a black hole 
So, you know, just to put everyone's minds at ease, our sun will never, one, explode uh, in, a, in a supernova or turn into a black hole. Uh, what it will do after millions and millions and millions of years will eventually, uh, it's the corona of the sun will expand to engulf the Earth. So there is a point at which the Earth uh, will no longer be habitable just simply because the sun exists. Uh, and then after that happens, the sun becomes a white dwarf and essentially stays as a white dwarf, which is a very stable star. And it will exist close to the end of the universe uh, when the white dwarfs will finally destabilize where they just die out enough to kind of dissipate. A neutron star, which are much, much more massive than the sun, are the ones that form black holes. And part of how they form a black hole is uh, an interesting phenomenon because it involves how nuclear fusion happens in a star. Uh, and essentially, what every star is, is a such a massive object of mostly hydrogen that is so closely packed together that at its core, the force of all of the gravity of all of these particles being stuck together causes the particles to fuse together. And that fusion reaction releases a tremendous amount of energy, which is where all of the solar radiation comes from that heats our planet and provides light to, you know, in our sky, same concept. Uh, and, and those stars, because of the process of fusion, that's how we get heavier and heavier elements. So we go from hydrogen, which is the lightest element, to uranium, which is uh, one, one of the heaviest naturally occurring elements. That happens as a result of stars fusing, dying, expending mass out into their local area, forming again, and some of the mass that they eject out over the course of billions and billions of years can form planets and other things. There's a whole lot of complex mechanics. But what happens when a big star goes supernova is what's actually happening is the fusion reaction uh, gets weaker and weaker and weaker. And so the mass of the star, it's pulling everything closer and closer together. So the star is starting to collapse in on itself. And, but as it collapses back down, that kind of reinvigorates the fusion reaction. Uh, and so what you get is this kind of collapse bang, and then it can still collapse down into a singularity afterwards. So you can get this big ejection of radiation and particles into the universe, and then what you're left with is a black hole and the remaining matter spinning around uh, as this accretion right. disk. It honestly, it honestly feels like you just taught me that better than any teacher did in <laughs> high school. <laughs> well, I, I mean, it, it, in, in full uh, appreciation of the teachers that taught me, it's a combination of what I was able to glean from things that I've read, but also, uh, uh, you know, teachers that I had in, in school who were also very passionate about this and did their best to uh, right. give me as much knowledge as they could. Now, if Neil deGrasse Tyson were here, I'm sure he would correct myriads of, you know, poor um, metaphors and things that I'm using. Because uh, we're we're talking about stuff where the the physics is simple on one level, extremely complicated on another level, and so uh, someone like Neil deGrasse Tyson is much better at the uh, correct metaphors to help someone understand. And I might be mixing mine from time to time. So, if any of this stuff interests right. you, I highly recommend you look up lectures that Neil deGrasse Tyson does. Universities like MIT have open courseware, and uh, a lot of times you can get lectures for a lot of uh, uh, upper division science classes and things there. So if you really want to do a deep dive on this, there are uh, resources out there that you can access for free to learn even more about this. Carl Sagan's um, uh, excellent program on the uh, creation of the universe uh, or, or through, the, through the Big Bang is also, uh, what's that one called? Um, shoot. It's where he has his famous quote, we were, we were made of stardust, which is what I was kind of referring to with the fusion reactions. That's what he means by the fact that we're made of stardust, is that the stars are these big atom oh, okay. Adam. I'm factories. familiar with that quote. Yeah. yeah. That's Carl Sagan. Well, and, and as a secondary full disclosure, whereas Chris has much more of an academic understanding of this stuff, I have more of a layman's uh, interest of it. Like, I love learning about space, and uh, I love any kind of... A uh, piece of fiction that is set in space. I love documentaries about space. I just don't. I don't have. I don't have a lot of the factual uh, academic knowledge when it comes to it. So that's why I was so excited for this episode because I knew you would have. You would have a lot of the fun answers to this stuff. Well, yeah, and and I think I, st which I have to be careful because I will t 
talk for a long period. I still haven't actually <laughs> answered your initial question, which is why I study black holes. Hey, at that's all. what we're here to do. And and we're here uh, to talk space, right, baby. Right. Well, about to say that the, the, essentially the simple answer to that is because you don't have all of the brightness of a star there, you can study a lot about gravity because you can see what's happening with these incredibly uh, powerful gravitational and magnetic uh, fields that are what would normally be around a star and are now around the collapsed core of a star. Uh, and then the other piece is you study black holes because they're oddities. They're, they're something that we initially didn't even know if they existed or not because when we were doing the physics of stars and things like that, I was like, well, it looks like this could maybe happen. Quantum mechanics says maybe this could happen, but that's weird. That would never happen, right? You wouldn't get something right. so massive that you suddenly... And so that's part of it, too, is this is... The study of objects like black holes help us better understand um, our theories and uh, laws of physics and nature uh, because... Well, and that's another thing the movie takes a huge liberty with is that the idea that entering a black hole would lead anywhere because isn't it isn't it also theorized that it's it's possible that if you were to try to quote unquote enter a black hole wouldn't wouldn't the idea be that you would just be crushed because of the gravitational force yeah that yes and it, it turns out it's maybe a bit more complicated than that i was actually just reading up a little bit on this and i won't speak too much on it because it's because we were having this conversation, it just kind of got me interested in trying to refresh some of my remembrances of black holes. Um, there are two kinds of two basic kinds of black hole. One is theoretical, and one is real. And by which I mean, anytime you study physics, and anybody out there who's taken a physics course or even, uh, uh, you know, uh, at, at pretty much any level, you'll you will quickly learn one rule about solving physics problems, and that is you assume as much as you can. So, you know, if if the right. problem doesn't specify, if it says, hey, I have a cannon and I'm trying to make a cannonball shoot this far, and it doesn't say I'm on, you know, uh, that you know, if it says I'm under the force of gravity, but it doesn't specify that I have air resistance, it makes the physics easier. So if I assume no air resistance, I can solve a simpler form of the problem, which gets me part of the way to a realistic answer. And so black hole physics is no different. When you start studying black hole physics, you start by saying, well, okay, let's assume I have a non-rotating black hole, so a black hole that's not spinning in space. And that makes some of the black hole physics simpler. But it turns out nothing is right. motionless in space. So anytime a black hole forms naturally, <laughs> it's always rotating because it was a star, and that star, as I was just explaining, was undergoing some pretty uh, serious events just prior to becoming a black hole. So it is definitely in motion in a lot of different ways. Well, and that, that seems to be the, the one constant with space is that uh, it's, it's radical change. Yeah. It's like there's a lot of violent and wild sort of evolution going on in space because we are dealing with so much extreme. Like we're dealing with extreme sizes, extreme pressure, extreme temperature. Nothing out there is like, you know, like you said, you got to understand a general science before you can narrow it down. You got to be right. in the ballpark exactly. before you can get on base. You got to, you know, with studying these black holes, clearly, you know, we study the one that's at the center of our universe. Maybe we get a better understanding of our own surroundings to a degree. Oh, or, yeah. You know. Well, yeah, because galactic uh, formation, uh, you know, how galaxies form, we'll, we will learn more about that by studying this thing because that's obviously one of right. the... Uh, massive objects that we have that helps keep the galaxy together because that's that's the that's one of the things you learn pretty early on is that um, especially in, in astrophysics is that if an object has mass it also has gravity gravity and mass are interlinked so because you have stuff that stuff has a gravitational force so like you know when you and I are standing next to each other with a beer we have other forces acting on us that are much stronger than the gravitational force of our mass, so we don't even notice that we have gravity, but we have gravity. Right. But it's once you get to these massive scales, that gravity, the way that the gravity equations actually work, every piece of mass in the universe influences every other piece of mass in the universe. Essentially, you know all of our... You know this is reminding me of? Yeah, what? I'm going <laughs> you know, to go take your... The, the theme of this episode is going to be you... You expressing things in, in scientific terms and me pulling it back down to earth with uh, 
with really dumb references. But this is what this is making me think of is uh, uh, what is probably my favorite episode of Futurama, where Bender becomes a, a kind of a god. Yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He I know this one. His own ecosystem on his body. Mm-hmm. Uh, that it reminds me of that with his it, when you say gravity affecting the things around us. Um, and of course, I love I love the the ending of that. Uh, the uh, <laughs> I, I became a god, or whatever he says, and, and the the quote unquote god or the entity at the center of the universe says, "Yeah, you were doing really good up until the point where everyone died." <laughs> right, and that right. kind of explains the harshness of the universe, right there yeah. in a nutshell. <laughs> yeah. Oh my gosh, that's a great episode. That that yeah. Mm-hmm. No, and that, that's and that. Exactly. There's a there's a lot to that because that's essentially uh, it, it is a way of expressing that thing of like everything is related to everything else because that's kind of what happens to the civilization that is is on Bender right. is that he makes a series of decisions <laughs> that then I think doesn't it eventually result in nuclear war? I think there's literally yeah, a I small nuclear he, war on his body. I believe he has a civilization that lives on his ass, and then a civilization that lives on his stomach. Oh, that's right. That's and what I it think is. they end up nuking each other. God. <laughs> but yeah, like when you, when you look at when you look at the the gravity equations, that's how it works out. Is you can like you can, in a local system, the influences of things hundreds of thousands of light years away, or millions of light years away, or billions of light years away, don't impact the local system to a point that you have to take them into account. Um, to get close enough to solve your equations but technically speaking the universe is just this big multi-body mass problem and so things like right. supermassive black holes their gravity influences the galaxy around them because they're now big enough that that's how things are orbiting or moving around each other in the milky way galaxy is around this big thing of mass and then galactic clusters do the same thing where they're orbiting each other because they are both very, very massive. And so, yeah, that's part of the reason for studying black holes is you can learn a lot more about gravity that way. Uh, and gravity is the thing that is quite literally holding us all together in, in some regards. <laughs> right. Um, well, and that's it's funny that you mentioned the importance of gravity. That brings us full circle to uh, interstellar. Where the, uh, I think another one of those big moments that, that people kind of said, all right, I've had enough of this fucking movie is, um, at some point they talk about the power of gravity and, uh, Matthew McConaughey when he's in the, um, the dream bookshelf and he says, it's gravity. I can communicate with it through gravity. He can, and he affects the, the gravity fields right. that spell out right. the, uh, the Morse code in dust or whatever. Oh, right. Oh, right. Yeah. <laughs> it yeah, all, yeah. yeah. It all comes back to gravity. <laughs> yeah, which like you know, I mean, like you say, it's kind of a totally wild thing, but right. Which it, I'm knocking the movie, but I love it. Like I absolutely love that shit. Well, and that's the thing. <laughs> it's just like I'm okay with that too because it it does make sense. There's not another force you could use inside of a black hole. Light can't escape. So you know, mm-hmm. even though he's in like the tesseract or whatever, that also means that like sound can't escape. So that's essentially you know when he knocks the books off the shelf the first time, that's the indication of that. Okay whatever mass I have here it can interact with the other mass there and I'm in a black hole so it's probably you, you know it's 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 through one of the gravitational right. forces that I'm doing which this thing. the the plot device they use in that scene of course is um, this tesseract that he has found his way to was designed by by a future version of themselves right so they don't have to understand it us as the viewer we don't have to understand it we just have to know that some future version of humanity designed this this format for Matthew McConaughey to uh, communicate. Specifically, I think his daughter. I think his daughter yes. sets it up. Or yeah, whatever. yeah. Um, yeah, which is kind of, it, it's a it's a bit of a wild thing because it's one of those where like there's there, the causality loop doesn't make sense because there's, there's right. you know, plenty of people that also like to talk about time travel and, and one of the things you quickly get into philosophically is that some time travel doesn't work if there isn't a reason to do the time travel, um, it, which... Right. It makes it like it makes it tricky of like wait so then so if if we open the in the interstellar if we humans open the wormhole and we made the tesseract but we didn't make it off of earth to do that like you see like it kind of doesn't work it's just like we would have had yeah. to we had to make it off of earth 
to be able to do that thing, but doing that thing is what let us get off of Earth, and so you're stuck in a in a causality loop, right? Where that's it, and that's that is precisely why I have it as my personal favorite, but maybe not what I think is the best, because just because it doesn't hold up to uh, some very specific prodding. But also, if we're gonna talk about plot holes in that movie, let's talk about um, at the very end uh, when he comes in to see his daughter in the hospital. And there are twenty some odd relatives standing around. Uh, not one person is interested in seeing their one hundred and fifty year old grandfather. I mean, I, I admit, if he walked in the room, I'd say, well, "Who the fuck is this? Who's guy? that but guy?" Right? Exactly. At some point, you got to get contact. Yeah, you're like, "Hang on, that's that's mom's dad, but he looks younger than mom." And he's been alive for 150 years. He just jumped through a wormhole. Like, right. he's also the right. first human that went through a black hole. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Nobody cares. <laughs> nah, man. Like, they didn't have okra anymore, dude. They're just happy that they're that they're going somewhere they can grow okra and play baseball. Not have to deal with the damn dust storms anymore. <laughs> hey, I mean, I like okra. And I, I think it... I, I think at some point, I think in one of the Casey Affleck scenes, I think they point out that... 90% of their dishes are just variations of corn. Right. So yeah. to be fair, they that was probably a pretty miserable existence. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it is one of those funny ones because, I mean, it's already kind of a joke in the U.S. that everything has corn in it because we grow a prodigious amount of corn here uh, right. to the point that even a lot of stuff that would normally have sugar in other, in other places uh, instead has corn syrup because uh, it turns out you can, you can distill corn down into a sweetener if you know what you're doing. Uh, so yeah, even, it, even the meat, wheat. I mean, the meat. Yeah. For instance, the land that we live on, we live on farmland that is rotated between soybeans and corn, and the kind of corn that's grown here is not the kind of corn that you eat. It's the kind that is fed to the meat that you eat. Yep. <laughs> yep. Silage. Yeah. It all starts with the corn. <laughs> that's, you know what? That's all the universe is made up of. It's it's just gravity and corn. Gravity and corn. <laughs> oh my god yeah I mean, that's that's probably the thing that honestly boggles my mind the most about like what makes up the universe is there's large amounts of it are hydrogen because that's mm. that's the simplest thing but and it, it's the stars that are literally making everything else so like when you when you step back and look at it it's like okay yeah like the life and death of stars made everything that I'm eating uh, on, on the one hand so so corn is stardust I'm also stardust you're also stardust. So is the car that I'm driving. So what I'm hearing is that eating corn is akin to cannibalism. <laughs> <laughs> We're all just stars eating stars and driving stars. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's that's more or less the first law of thermodynamics boiled down. Uh, energy can't be created or destroyed. That's another physics concept you learn is that mass and energy are interchangeable. That's what that's what actually what E equals M C squared. That's what that equation is. It's a mass energy conversion equation. If you convert right, all of the mass of, of something directly into just straight energy, that's what you get. Now, of course, in real life you lose something in the transfer. You lose, you know, thermal uh, energy that can't be recaptured or other stuff. So it's not a perfect equation, but it is that tells you theoretically an object of X amount of mass. So, yes, yeah, so E for energy equals M, which is mass, times the speed of light squared. That's what C is, is right. the speed of light. So That's one of the few things I remember. Another thing I remember from my early uh, scientific classes, and also just from being a comic book nerd, is that uh, you, cannot, you cannot create more mass than there is. Right, uh, right. Because that comes up a lot with superheroes whose uh, powers are... You know your usual comic book fuckery, um, or like somebody somebody who uh, enlarges or, or changes shapes or sizes, it becomes a point of contention where it's like, oh, this here's a guy who he might have majored in creative writing, but all of a sudden he has to consider the laws of physics when he's writing right. about this comic right. book character, right. like you know. Well, it, it is kind of fun because you you can mess with that a little bit with a couple of uh, physics sleight of hands in a way. Because right. yeah, you're right. Like so, so mass is conserved. Mass is conserved because energy is conserved. But you can transfer between the two. So you know, uh, someone like Superman, you can easily explain away uh, getting bigger or smaller because well, he's powered by the energy of the yellow sun. So he's stealing some of the sun's <laughs> mass. So like, if that were one of Superman's powers, 
Right. That's that. Just, yeah, it's it's a mass energy conversion. That actually makes sense. The sun's out, so he can do it. Um, right. The other uh, thing, a common though, example would be uh, uh, Mr. Fantastic Reed Richards, right? Is uh, a character who changes his shape and size, and that is often given the the MacGuffin of uh, well, they got their powers from cosmic radiation, quote unquote. So yeah, uh, you know, Which... the cosmic the cosmic radiation within their bodies is fluctuating in su- in such a way that his. Uh, mass and energy ratios can be manipulated or you know and usually at that point people stop reading they're like all right i get it he just he stretches right exactly he changes <laughs> he changes the way he looks yeah because that's it, that is one of those that doesn't you know, quite hold water but also when the fantastic four came out we had a you know generally speaking the wider public had a pretty weak understanding of radiation yeah that was the 60s so, right exactly yeah um uh Oh, she, oh, yeah, I was going to say, the, the other trick you can play, though, is, so, there's a, a general rule of thumb that uh, things become more chaotic over time, so it's entropy, right? So, as the longer a system is active, the more it degrades and it loses energy, and that, that loss of, or not loses energy entirely, but the energy is lost where it can't be brought back, so, like I say, lost to, like, thermal heat or sound or other things where it's not convertible back again. Even though it still exists in the universe because it's been sent out, it's not practically convertible, let's call it that. Um, but one of the laws of, of the universe is that while the entropy of the universe increases, local entropy can decrease as long as the overall entropy of the universe continues to increase. So somebody who suddenly changes mass is just changing entropy to their advantage in the local area at the detriment of some other portion of the universe. <laughs> so it's uh, <laughs> then it becomes kind of the alchemical equation of... Uh, uh, um, oh, shoot. I blanked on it. The first rule of alchemy from Full Metal Alchemist. Oh, the, the, the law of equivalent exchange. <laughs> Where, uh, I don't, did you ever see Full Metal Alchemist at all? I have not. It's on my it's on my watch list. Uh, it's it's very it's very good. It's it. Uh, I'll I'll warn you now. It gets heavy in a couple of places, uh, but it's it's very good overall. But that one, uh, th- their their magic is alchemy, and alchemy demands equivalent things in exchange for. Uh, it, oh, yeah, I'm being okay. I'm, I'm being reminded of equivalent exchange. If I didn't say that earlier. Um, I'm into that. Yeah, I so, like that. So it's kind of a, it's kind of a nod to thermod- the laws of thermodynamics and, uh, and mass energy conservation, uh, which, in the realm of Full Metal Alchemist, sometimes has unforeseen and detrimental consequences to its users. Uh, so, <laughs> hmm. yeah. Uh, but yes, uh, back to space. Where are we? Gravity? Uh, <laughs> it beats me. <laughs> I know we, we got lost on a tangent there for a second. I first, say, first question out of the seen, gate. <laughs> <laughs> have you ever seen the... Uh, we all know that William Shatner went to space. Yeah. Which is a pretty huge achievement. You ever seen the video of... Um, they land and uh, someone's trying to interview him. And uh, Jeff Bezos is kind of more... Uh, wrapped up in the accomplishment of it all, not necessarily what they did, but yeah. the fact that he did it. You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Um, I'll share. I'll share that video on Discord because it's very funny. the The reporter is is kind of like, so what was it like to finally go to space? And you know, Shatner's a very uh, abstract man who is is describing, you know, well, you know, being up in the stars is so, you know, it's breathtaking, it's speechless. And uh, Jeff Bezos kind of comes in from off screen. And he's like. Yeah, let's pop these bottles, and he's shaking up champagne bottles, and he's putting hats on people, and it's kind of a it's kind of a perfect little sixty second clip that embodies where America is right now. Where yeah, there is, it really... there's there's the person who is like marveling at space, and there's the person who is they want the credibility of yep. going to space. Yep. <laughs> yeah, which like. We're in a really we're in a really interesting position with space exploration right now, where there's a combination of obviously uh, public organizations that are trying to make it in space, but also a variety of private organizations that are trying to make it into space, with a why you know wildly different objectives in some cases. Uh, so like you know as a right 
as a compare and contrast, Blue Origin, which is which is the uh, Jeffrey Bezos's uh, uh, program, is focused on space tourism, uh, whereas SpaceX is focused on space tourism partly, but also on also doing heavy lift uh, for satellite launches. You know, Elon Musk has his plans for uh, a global uh, internet satellite network and a variety of other things like that. You have the various militaries of the world who are wanting to get their satellites into orbit to conduct espionage and signals intelligence and, and everything else. You've got other uh, uh, NGOs and and for-profit corporations that just want to be able to do GPS and mapping. Um, you've got the you know European Space Agency and the Indian Space Agency and the Chinese Space Agency and NASA, uh, the North American uh, Space and Aeronautics Administration, uh, who all want to get like their telescopes the, up there and, and everything else, yeah. It's like taking the original space race and instead of it being, you know, us and the Soviets, it is now, it's every major country and political party versus billionaires. It's literally yeah. like guys who have achieved enough money that they're like hey i can enter the literal space race yeah right exactly <laughs> which is kind of wild to think about uh it it, it is because i mean that's the that's the thing when you look at like well especially when you look at movies like 2001 space odyssey right like that's part of it like you know the the moon mm -hmm. is as much a destination for people to go and live or vacation at or things like that as it is an area for science and, and that's kind of the beginning of 2001 is the is the transit right. from earth to, also, to the moon in our reality it's also a piece of land for someone to uh, stake claim to or at least try to anyway right exactly and that's unfortunately that, and that's that's part of it all you have to do is look at a sci-fi series like The Expanse which I think does a, a pretty good job at sort of logically extrapolating what some of the socio-political concerns would be of a of a fully uh, uh, populated solar system where humans have taken to the stars for centuries you know and, and, and done it in a in a way that, like, because they have the Epstein drive in in uh, 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 the Expanse series, which is kind of a hand wavy fusion drive. But other than that, like, there's no faster than light travel, so it's it's a relatively uh, hard science sort of sci-fi with a heavy amount of uh, uh, sort of space military and space politics thrown in, and I think done in a very interesting way. Right. Um, uh, but yeah, speaking of. Uh, ambitious endeavors at the moment so the space web telescope is has has reached its lagrange point and is doing its calibration and we are getting ready to start seeing uh some crisp star field pictures coming back from it uh, that will be uh unsullied by the light of our sun which is exciting we'll be able to see farther and dimmer stars than we've ever seen before uh on top of that the artemis program is getting ready to kick off its first launch in uh august i think which is the NASA's return to moon program. Uh, so they've, they've partnered, I think Boeing is doing the uh, crew capsule for that, and the heavy lift rocket's going to so, be doing a, a first unmanned flight, uh, like I say, in August, for like 23 days or something. Will be the mission So time. for the average person like myself, who I, I, I very loosely stay up to date in current events, but oftentimes things slip through the cracks for me. So for instance, someone like me, uh, what I don't know where NASA is right now in terms of I know I think during the Trump administration they had talked about defunding it or uh, uh, not focusing on space travel as much um, so I know there's a lot of politics that go into NASA yeah, very much so so they are are they are they pretty much in full swing now as far as like NASA is still uh, creating missions and they're they're still doing research and things like that? Or... Yeah, I mean, they it, NASA has had a long and complicated history in terms of how much funding they have. Because, I mean, obviously the period during the space race, the United States government threw money at NASA and said, we want to get to the moon first. How do we do this? And right. uh, so, you know, there was, there was a, a pretty uh, ambitious budget and also really ambitious goals. I mean, President Kennedy... Uh, uh, you know, laid out the we're going to make it to the moon fast, and so that kind of lit the fire under 
uh, everybody's asses to to get stuff moving and to do that kind of rapid iterative R&D on a very short time cycle is incredibly expensive and so NASA was given right. <laughs> uh, something like a blank check for for part of that time period because uh, that's you know for anybody who doesn't know much about the history of the space race both us and the the, the former Soviet Union uh, were essentially using nuclear missiles as spaceships because that was the only like truly complex rocket systems we had were ICBMs, intercontinental ballistic right. missiles, that were multi-stage weapon systems, and we decided instead of putting a nuclear warhead on the top of one of them, we put a little crew capsule and a guy in it. So, uh, <laughs> what one could of, go wrong? Well, that's the thing. One of the interesting early challenges <laughs> is the Redstone rockets. Uh, I think it was the tight. Maybe it was the Titans first. I'd have to double check because I'm a little bit rusty on my nuclear weapon systems at the moment. But essentially, the launch success rate of our intercontinental ballistic missiles, the United States' intercontinental ballistic missiles, at the time the space program started was a 86% chance of successful launch. And the rest would be a failure to launch. Some of those uh, resulted in catastrophic explosions. Uh, not of the nuclear warhead going off, but of the uh, you know, essentially uh, of the fuel and <laughs> oxidizer going off wrong. Right off the bat, um, 86%. That's a percentage that sounds good in uh, literally any other context. But if if you start talking about leaving the planet Earth, <laughs> and 86 sounds a little scary. I must say, and that's exactly where I was going, because that's the thing. When, we, when you look at the history of the Cold War, our nuclear stockpiles in the Soviet Union's were massive. And so 86% still meant mission success, uh, by which I mean the destruction of the entire planet, Uh <laughs> <laughs> in, in that scenario. But yeah, that's exactly it. That was NASA's first problem was they looked at that. It's like, great. Exactly what you said. In any other context, that's a great number. Not when we got to put a guy in space. We need that to be like 99.999% chance of launch success. Right. So th they quite literally blew up a bunch of rockets uh, doing uh, testing before they finally got something that was successful. If you ever watch the movie The Right Stuff, which I highly recommend, it's a great film, there is a hilarious montage of rocket explosions uh, that is depicts this time in NASA's history when they're trying to actually get the first rockets ready for the Gemini program, which was the first manned uh, space launch for the U.S. The Soviet Union, obviously, they... they went a little bit faster than we did on that point. Uh, they got the first satellite into space with Sputnik, and uh, Yuri Gagarin was the first uh, uh, human in space. Uh, and But then where the United States succeeded and the, the Soviet program didn't was that uh, the Soviet Union couldn't figure out an effective heavy lift rocket to make it all the way to the moon. We came up with the Saturn V, uh, which was what the Apollo program used, and then Apollo 11 with Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin um, and uh, uh, Co uh, Michael Collins. I think that's right. Collins. I know it's Collins. Hang on. I have to make sure. Everybody always forgets all of the astronauts in Apollo 11, and I want to make sure I give credit where credit is due here. <laughs> I know it's Collins, but... Yeah, okay, Michael Collins. I got it right. Look at that. Holy cow, yeah. Uh, which Michael Collins, for those who don't know, is the, the Apollo program. It's a three-man spacecraft, and so it's two spacecraft uh, sorry it's a three man mission and a two spacecraft mission so there's the command module which is what you launch in and the lunar module which you have to dock with once you get up into space and the lunar module is what's going to land on the moon and so you can't put everybody in the lunar module to go to the moon somebody's got to stay behind with the other spaceship because in the 1960s and the first manned moon mission Apollo 11 successfully landed in 19, July of 1969 uh, you didn't have full bore automation so you didn't want to not have a human pilot there ready to receive you back from the moon. So uh, Neil Armstrong and right. Buzz Aldrin got to pilot the lunar module down to the lunar surface, and Michael Collins stayed behind to the command module to keep it in a stable orbit and orbited above them while they did their thing and then uh, helped with the docking process on the way back. So, But anyhow, that was, that was where you know, I, we succeeded. To bring this back to a commoner level, again, in this conversation, I am the... Uh, I'm the layman who is uh, <laughs> mostly connecting these dots to uh, pop culture. I always knew that um, uh, Commander Shepard of the Mass Effect series, he was named after somebody significant. And it wasn't until I looked it up just now to remind myself that Alan Shepard was technically the first American in space. Mm -hmm. 
That is correct. Uh, due to suborbital flight, he spent nine days in space. Nine days and 57 minutes. Which is pretty cool. It's, I yeah. mean, it's, it's kind of funny when you talk about remembering astronauts. Because that's what made me think of it was there's a guy who gets left out a lot. And it's, it's, you think about Buzz Aldrin and, uh, and like the astronauts who literally landed on the moon. And suddenly that is like, who cares who went to space first? Let's, I want to hear who landed on the moon. And it makes me wonder, are we going to forget about those guys when we get to higher milestones? You know, if we manage to put somebody on other planets, are we going to be like, who cares who was on the, on the moon first? You know what I mean? I, well, you know, it is, it is kind of a funny thing because that's, it, up until space flight it was kind of hard to define some of those achievements too because so many human endeavors um, were undertaken simultaneously by lots of people around the world like you know uh, Wilbur and Orville Wright are often credited as the first uh, uh, people to succeed at heavier than air flight uh, with with their aircraft but there were also pilots in France and pilots in in Britain and all of the you know uh, uh, places like that who succeeded at a very similar time period, uh, and in fact for a long while until essentially records were counted, uh, France held the uh, 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 world first in flight. It turns out the Wright brothers flew just a little bit before uh, I forgot who the aviator was in France, but yeah, I mean like that that sort of thing because obviously. These are all developed uh, 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 technologies that the, the world technology was at a state where bunches of people could try this all at once. So it was kind of hard to actually figure out. It's the same with lots of, you know, uh, quote unquote, explorer milestones. It turns out humans have been traveling the earth for quite a long time. Uh, and so, you know, people who think they've discovered something first often haven't just because uh, they might be the first right. ones that managed to get a record of it in a book or something that has survived. Uh, but other people may may have been there and in a lot of cases have been there and have left signs behind, but they're buried deep underneath the ground where the explorer who has the credit for finding it, you know, stood and didn't realize that someone else had been it there would before. Be, it would be very interesting to see a, uh, it would be interesting to see a world history of a, uh, from like a third, a third party perspective of oh, like yeah. a database of, of everyone in the world who's done everything, obviously yeah, we'll never know that. But and that—that's the it thing is, is interesting it's, to think about that. It, it very much so is, and that's like I say with with space, it's kind of the first where you have because it is obviously also a very modern project, so it's still very fresh in the public consciousness. But also where you can be pretty sure that well, actually, people haven't been that high before, you know. Yeah, right. Just to just to put this in in perspective of. Uh, Nolan films that we were talking about earlier, we have the best case of this documented in American, well, not American, in world history with uh, Nikola Tesla and Edison. Oh, yeah. With the, because uh, that, that is a, that is a plot point in the prestige is, uh, is Tesla uh, trying to, uh, to beat Edison in that sort of uh, mass marketed electricity race. And uh, that's kind of the perfect example of like, well, of course, Edison is the guy that we attribute everything to, but Tesla is the dude who was like, he's like the world's most famous uh, runner-up, almost. <laughs> right. Not to right. insult the man, but you know. Well, and that I mean, it, <laughs> nobody exactly. gives him the credit he deserves. Well, and that's that. It is. It's a fascinating story, and in a lot of ways, we're still living out uh, Tesla's vision for electricity because alternating current was his thing. Edison thought direct current was going mm. to be the best, which. Turns out DC current's what we use in a lot of semiconductors and stuff like that, so your computers use DC. But you can't get electricity across very big distances with DC current, so our modern power grids wouldn't be possible without the technologies that Tesla pioneered. Uh, so, yeah, like mm. that's the thing, is that even though, even though history kind of sees them as a runner-up, in some regards, our infrastructure you know, and what we're able to do as, as a modern society owes more to Tesla than it does Edison, weirdly. The unsung champion. <laughs> that's a, that's that's why he gets played by David Bowie in that movie. <laughs> oh wait, what, are you serious? Yeah, he's uh, David Bowie plays Tesla in in the Prestige. Oh, I've got to, I have I have got to watch the Prestige now. I love David. Bowie. Well, there you go. That that's your motivation to watch it now. Get in there for some of that. And it's not even it's not even Bowie being like silly or hamming it up. He's he's just acting. He's just playing a role, and he he's perfect. <laughs> That's awesome. 
Yeah. I'll have, oh man, I did not. And I, I think uh, that. Andy Andy Circus plays his assistant. Oh wow. <laughs> so it's David Bowie and Andy Circus working on Tesla coils. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> oh, that's fabulous. <laughs> Yeah, we'll have to do a uh, we'll have to touch base when you when you get a chance to watch that because I think you will enjoy that movie. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I uh, I'm kind of I'm like I'm not doing a hundred movie challenge, but I I feel a kindred uh, connection with that idea because I am have many many films that I am woefully behind on getting caught up on. Uh, you know, I only recently caught up on mm. well, kind of caught up on the MCU. I uh, still haven't gotten fully caught up, although I have, as you know, have seen Endgame. Uh, I did also see the new Doctor Strange right. film, uh, talking about hey, so did I. space and we'll the universe and mind bendy stuff. Yeah, I'm about to say we, that would be. Uh, well, maybe we could do that uh, for next week for the news. Actually, I I, I hesitate Sounds to talk to anything about it now because it's it's one of those where it's new enough. I don't want to accidentally spoil anything for anybody because uh, some of the stuff right. that uh, happens in that film is. Uh, pretty cool and I was pretty surprised by and would like other people to have that experience mm. so yeah um, for sure uh, but yeah uh, do we have uh, do we have anything else we want to touch on I, I, I pulled up a couple of ad- additional things I have one that is actually uh, news of a different sort about space um but it will take us oh. in a wildly different direction. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with that. I think that's what I'm going to do next. So, uh, Dungeons & Dragons, Wizards of the Coast, who has the Dungeons & Dragons license, is releasing a new uh, D&D supplement this August. And it is, I'm actually just going to read their blurb, which is just uh, uh, from, from their website. Uh, it is Spelljammer Adventures in Space. Set sail for the stars, a thrilling mm. space-based adventure setting for the world's greatest role-playing game. Spelljammer Adventures in Space presents the astral plane as a Dungeons & Dragons campaign setting unlike any other. Uh, it's going to have, it's a, it'll be a 64-page hardcover book uh, with uh, a whole bunch of extra new monsters and uh, uh, all kinds of neat new settings. Uh, I think the, the cover art or some of the things they released had for anybody who is a fan of the Baldur's Gate series, uh, and particularly Baldur's Gate 3 that Larian is working on currently, the Nautiloid ships that the Bind Flayers use are, show up in the Spelljammer book. So... So that's kind of exciting because the astral plane is like the total fantastical antithesis to uh, our understanding of space, where instead it's it's a it's a plane of existence that exists between material planes. So it's essentially D and D's version of space, but you can exist in it. It's not like you need to have a spacesuit because you're in hardvac. It's its own, uh, I guess, transitory area of D and D. So you can have your your mode of travel because right. it is like it's like an ocean essentially a space ocean in a way uh, kind of almost maybe similar in some regards to how Disney does Treasure Planet uh, where it's you know you, you, you're sailing the cosmos in your ship but you can also be up on deck and enjoying the view without having to have a respirator on or a full space suit so uh, I'm really excited for that uh, just because that'll be a wildly different uh campaign setting that you can have now for Dungeons and Dragons uh, and so it's it's related yeah. to space only tangentially in that uh, <laughs> it's the D&D equivalent but obviously a totally well, fantastic speaking universe. of tangentially related <clears throat> uh, last episode I promised I would do a follow up on Warhammer Battle Sectors Ooh, update yeah. uh, it has officially been improved as far as uh, the Xbox One and console, whatever update they did, fixed it. Fixed it right up. Hey, that's fantastic. I, uh, I'm glad to hear that. Uh, I am glad that we are in yeah, an era uh, where... I, not it, monumental news, but you know. <laughs> no, but I mean, like, I, I remember back in the day when, like, if there was a bug on an, on an Xbox game, 
you were just toast because there was no way to do a patch fix. Like you, the, the company would have to respin a new disc. There, there was no delivery system to actually fix the fix the game on your console. I was where you know where computer gamers had it easy for a long time because we could just surf the web and find the official patch and download it and install it and fix whatever bugs we had in our game. Uh, and then I, I remember one com- one fateful evening when Zach called me up and was like, "Yep, uh, Nice Little Republic is broken." It's like, how? What do you mean? It's like it's it's a bug in the game. It's just every time it happens, uh, it breaks your your game save. And I was playing Nice Little Republic at the time and was nearly to the part pl- he had talked about, but I was playing on a PC, so I looked it up. I was like. Yeah, wow, that's a game-breaking bug. Good thing they released this patch. <laughs> I fired up the executable and fixed my game, and then uh, I forget Zach figured out some kind of workaround. But like, he lost like hours and hours and hours and hours of gameplay. He had to start from scratch because it, it just broke the save. Uh, and like the same thing happened even with uh, Skyrim on the oh, PlayStation uh, when it came on on PS3 because it was just coded in a way that wasn't conducive to the PS3, and even with the ability to patch, they couldn't quite get around bloated game files that caused a total lockup of the console. So we're in an exciting era where the consoles can actually be uh, kept updated in a, in a good way. So, Yeah. Well, uh, the last little bit of semi-space-related news I have is... Um... Uh, content creator I follow, uh, Markiplier. I'm sure a lot of oh, other yeah. people have watched some of his videos. I know you've watched some. Markiplier just... Um, he's known for doing some live action stuff, uh, some narrative stuff. He just made Markiplier in Space, which is... Um, it's hard to explain. There's technically only two episodes, but the way that it works is very similar to the way Netflix did Bandersnatch. So... As you are watching the episode, just have your remote or your mouse or whatever handy because it will prompt you with a choose a left or right type decision uh, and uh, the content keeps going from there. So the, the runtime of each individual episode of the two episodes is not accurate because uh, where it says like the first video is like seven minutes long, it's actually, you know, 20 or 30 minutes long, however long as you choose each option that links you to the next video. Oh, clip. that's cool. Uh, it's kind of a choose your own adventure. It's a lot of fun. I really enjoyed it. Uh, I cannot wait. I'll have to try that out. Because, yeah, he did like a, he did a heist that way as well, I think, a couple mm-hmm. of years back. Uh, I had seen some right. blurb for this or, or a preview video, but I didn't, I didn't realize it was out. That's pretty cool. Yeah, it's a, it's a lot of fun. But uh, that's all I've got, really. Well, in that case... Uh, this is, I think, an excellent place to wrap up. And thank you very much for coming along on this uh, wild and uh, science-filled evening. Uh, more science-filled than I intended for it to be. Uh, so hopefully that uh, was not too much. Oh, that's exactly what I wanted. Well, I'm glad to hear that. <laughs> um, uh, we, we have said this often on this show, but uh, uh, obviously I'm shooting from the hip a bit here on some of the stuff, and it's things I've learned up in my noggin, but... Always feel free to fact check me if you found something that uh, we talked about interesting. I do uh, sincerely hope that you will go out and learn more about it, do your own research. And if (laughs) if any of you physicists out there note a grievous error that I have made and wish to correct it, you can let us know by contacting us through our website at www.writeandnerdy.com. That's www.writeandnerdy.com. If you liked the show but weren't able to be here for the entire uh, live stream or just want to rewatch it uh, because you found my description of black holes to be that riveting, uh, we post all of Right Nerdy News with the Right Nerdy News crew on our YouTube channel. So go over to YouTube and follow us there. Otherwise, we record this show every Thursday evening here on twitch.tv slash right and nerdy at 7 p.m. Central, 8 p.m. Eastern Time. Uh, if you haven't gotten enough of Right and Nerdy generally and want to listen to our live podcast, you can also catch that on twitch.tv slash Right Nerdy every Sunday night at 8 p.m. Central, 9 p.m. Eastern Time. The podcast goes up to YouTube as well the following Thursday and also to our podcast RSS feed. And you can listen to our podcast anywhere good RSS feeds can be found, including Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Libsyn, and Verbal. If you've got an RSS client you want us to be uh, more formally present on, 
Use that website to uh, contact us again, and we'll happily make our presence known. If you are following us here on Twitch, thank you very much. If you haven't followed yet, please do that thing so that way we can eventually become a Twitch affiliate and get some fun emotes. Uh, also, if you pop over to our YouTube page, we'd love it if you give us a like, follow, and a comment. It helps bring our videos farther up the YouTube algorithm. I think that covers the business, Jay. If there's uh, anything else, uh, any final greetings for the for the folks out there? Yeah, I think that just about does it. Um, like Chris said, tune in on Sunday if you guys want to catch the uh, the main show streaming. Um, and we're all uh, we're all just keeping it casual while Zach's gone. So if you have any ideas <laughs> for things you want us to talk about. Absolute toot and lootly. Without that, without any further ado, take care, stay, take care, stay safe, and don't have too much fun without us. Adios, y'all. Nailed it. <laughs> Do it. <laughs>